Welcome to Mausel, a wonderfully picturesque seaside village nestled on the delightful south coast of Cornwall. Once described by the poet Dylan Thomas as the loveliest village in England, Mausel is a true delight. And on this walk around the village, we'll wander through a collection of higgledy-piggledy lanes and alleyways, visit Mausel's oldest building of all, and even venture out along the coastal path, which offers spectacular views across Mounts Bay, towards Penzance, and the world-famous St Michael's Mount. All of that is to come over the next 25 minutes or so, but we begin our walk taking in a view of Mausel Harbour at low tide, where a collection of local fishing boats wait patiently for the water to come rushing in once again. The harbour is the central feature of this tiny Cornish village, and for centuries it supported not only the people living here, but also this part of Cornwall more widely, as back in the medieval era, Mausel here was the most important port on the wide open Mounts Bay. The harbour and the rest of the village are protected from the often rough waves of Mounts Bay, part of the English Channel, by this strong harbour wall. But on the other side of the wall we can see that the bay today is beautifully calm, home to the small St Clement's Isle just in front of us here, and in the far distance, about two miles along the coast, the major town of Penzance, as well as the mighty St Michael's Mount, which lends its name to Mounts Bay. Now, we'll take a walk alongside the bay at the end of our tour of the village. But before we venture out onto the coastal path, we need to begin exploring the ins and outs of Mausel itself, a fairly small village home to less than a thousand permanent residents in the modern day. But while it may be small, the streets of Mausel are filled to the brim with rich heritage, as they drape down the side of the cliffs towards the expansive harbour here. Like many coastal villages in Cornwall, Mausel owes its origins to fishing. As we mentioned, this was once the premier fishing port in this part of Cornwall, for the best part of 300 years, between the 13th and 16th centuries. Fishing continues in earnest to this day, and as well as the boats dotted around the harbour here, you'll see telltale signs of the local industry all over the village, with local families often selling their catches to the many tourists who come to visit during the busy summer months. Of course, in the 21st century, Mausel is one of many historic fishing villages in Cornwall, which are extremely popular with tourists. The village's beauty and natural serenity, of course, drawing in people from all over the country and even further afield. And as we shift our view away from the harbour, that's why the village's waterfront is now lined by a collection of quaint shops and eateries which are squarely aimed at visitors. One of a number of examples around Mausel that showcase the significant impact of tourism on this community. We'll talk more about tourism a little later on, but let's turn our attention to the intriguing story behind this village's name which we can see written on a pair of the local shop fronts here. Despite what you can see in front of you, the village's name is not pronounced Mousehole, but rather Mausel, and there are plenty of different theories as to where exactly it came from. Some say that the village's name derives from a large sea cave beyond the other side of the harbour, which was for decades popularly used by smugglers to hide their goods and themselves from the eyes of the law. Others suggest that Mausel may indeed come from the Cornish language. The word Moishel said to mean something like the mouth of the river of young maidens. Although the village's actual name in Cornish is entirely different, known as Porth Ennis, which means the port of the island, referring to St Clement's Isle, which we saw a few moments ago. Whatever the true origin of this village's name, its pronunciation trips up many unsuspecting visitors. So remember to tell the bus driver that you need a ticket to Mausel. And once you've arrived, you'll be dropped off just in front of a beautiful pair of buildings here. The pink coloured cornerstone cottage standing as a friendly neighbour to the village's rather tall clock tower. Now the clock tower is a relatively recent addition to the village constructed just over a hundred years ago in the late 19th century to stand on top of the much older harbour office, 
the main building which has been used for generations to oversee all of the activity on the harbour down below. Given that the harbour master inside needed to know pretty much everything that was going on in the village's port, the harbour office has a spectacular view of this historic dock, which is also overlooked here by Mausel's prominent war memorial, which pays tribute to those who lost their lives fighting in the First and Second World Wars. The memorial was erected in 1920, and it stands at the intersection of most of Mausel's main roads, with the harbour front street that we've just walked along, known as North Cliff, and the street we now find ourselves on, known as South Cliff. South Cliff here is home to just a handful of buildings, the most notable of which is the Ship Inn, just beside us here. Mausel was once upon a time home to five inns, but today the ship is the last remaining of them, housed inside a building which dates to the 18th century. Having begun life as a much-loved watering hole for locals, as well as those arriving into the village's port on boats, in later years the ship gained a famous regular in the form of the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas, who spent his honeymoon here in 1937. And if you venture inside the pub today, you'll find a corner of the bar marked out as Dylan's Corner, dedicated to the place where he would sit. The outside of the inn here, meanwhile, is home to the Fitzroy Barometer, a small device which was loaned to the village in the 1850s to warn fishermen of impending bad weather out on Mounts Bay, an important little gizmo which likely saved many lives from the perils of life at sea. In the shadow of the ship inn is of course Mausel Harbour, this part of the harbour a slightly newer facility known as the South Quay, which was built back in 1838 to help bolster the capacity of the lively local fishing industry, which remained fully active for decades after its heyday came to an end in the 16th century. In a few minutes we'll return to the harbour side and learn more about Mausel's famous local industry. But let's now take a moment to get lost in the maze of narrow streets tucked behind the waterfront. This captivating Cornish village is home to more than 700 years of recorded history, and for much of that time these fetching streets have been home, mostly, to local families who made a living from fishing. Over the last 200 years, however, ever more people who've visited Mausel and been enchanted by the village have elected to move here, People such as the artist Nigel Hallard, who stumbled upon the village one day in 1963 and stayed to paint it for decades afterwards, immortalising the sights and people of Mausel in a number of beautiful artworks. Hallard is one of a long line of artists who've spent time in Mausel to capture its beauty on canvas. But as well as gorgeous scenery, another appeal of this village is its rich history. And just around the corner here on Kegwin Place, we find what is, perhaps, Mausel's most riveting landmark of all. This distinctive building is known as the Kegwin Arms, and it's best known to locals as the oldest building in Mausel. It was built in the 14th century, and it's the last surviving building in the village from before 1595, the year when Mausel was attacked and burned to the ground by Spanish soldiers. As the rest of Mausel was destroyed, the Kegwin Arms here was fiercely defended by its owner, a man named Squire Jenkin Kegwin. And while he successfully prevented his home's demise, he was sadly killed by a Spanish cannonball on that fateful day. But Kegwin isn't the only notable resident to have lived in this part of Mausel. Just here we find the former home of a local woman named Dolly Pentreath, who died back in December 1777 as one of the very last native speakers of the Cornish language. Some say that Dolly may have even been the very last fluent speaker of Cornish, and so with her death came the extinction of the native tongue as a community language, the ever-growing influence of English at the time leading it to overtake Cornish in day-to-day -day life here. As you might know, the Cornish language, one of the many distinctive Celtic tongues you'll find across Great Britain, has since been revived. But it was only in 2010, 233 years after Dolly Pentreath's death, that Cornish was no longer classified as an extinct language. 
Even today, with an ever-growing number of native Cornish speakers, things are very different to how they were in 18th century Mausel. This village, located in the westernmost part of Cornwall, known as Penwith, which was historically the most Cornish-speaking area of all. There are plenty more intriguing Cornish language facts that we'll stumble across as we continue our walk around Porthenis, as Mausel is known in the native tongue. But as you'll have noticed, we've returned to the harbour side, and here we find ourselves on a small waterfront street known simply as the Wharf, which is lined by a collection of cottages with small boats parked just outside. Now today, Mausel Harbour is home to a small scattering of boats, some used for fishing, and others simply as pleasure craft. But back in the day, the harbour here was much more crowded. In fact, in the late 18th century, there were as many as 55 boats being operated here. Today, as tourism has taken over, things are a little less active in the harbour. But locals do continue to sell goods that they've retrieved from the sea, whether that be in the form of fish, or, as we can see here, selling seashells on the seashore, in charming little bags for a nice price. And so, after you've picked up your bag of shells as a souvenir of your visit to this lovely coastal village, take a look back out across the harbour, because there are centuries of history on display right in front of us. Trading activity has been recorded as taking place in Mausel as far back in time as the year 1267, but the harbour was much smaller at that time, surrounded by a small key wall which was built in the early 14th century. The main harbour walls that we see today, known as the North and South Piers, are much more recent creations of the Victorian era, and today they enclose not just an area for mooring boats, but also a couple of nice sandy beaches, perfect for sitting back and relaxing under the Cornish summer sun. And of course, when the tide does come back in, the shelter provided by the sea walls also creates a safe and pleasant area to dip your toes in the water of the English Channel. At the moment, with the harbour at low tide, swimming may not be an option, but the view back across towards the North Cliff is as beautiful as any other that you'll find in this village. But remember, things haven't always been quite so serene. Not only was Mausel once buzzing with activity as a premier Penwith port, but as we mentioned, in the late 16th century, it fell victim to a truly devastating attack. While Squire Kegwin gave his life to save his house, everything else that you see in Mausel today dates from after the Spanish attack of 1595. But the question has to be asked, what did Spanish soldiers have against a seemingly harmless Cornish fishing port like this. Well, as we make our way inland along Portland Place here, the Spanish attack on Mausel is said to have been an act of revenge for England's defeat of the Spanish Armada just seven years beforehand. As they rebuilt their navy with new bases in France, the Spanish eyed Cornwall, directly across the Channel, as a target to signal their return to form. And so, in the summer of 1595, they sent a fleet of 400 soldiers to wreak havoc on communities around Mounts Bay. Not only was Mausel burned to the ground, but the Spanish also sacked and destroyed the neighbouring settlements of Paul, Newlyn and Penzance. But of all these, Mausel was the greatest loss. What had for centuries been the bay's leading port lay in ashes, bringing an end to the village's true heyday. Fortunately, as we can see around us, the village was rebuilt, the streets now lined by a vast array of sturdy stone houses, many of which date from the 18th and 19th centuries. Of course, while the Spanish attack initially wrecked Mausel's position as a leading port in the region, we know that fishing and trading activity didn't die out completely. In fact, the village retained a healthy waterborne trade until as recently as the first half of the 20th century with most of the houses that we're walking between now used by local families to support that local industry. As well as family homes, the buildings that line Mausel streets historically doubled as workshops, storehouses, mills and more, and many houses today bear names that hint towards their former purposes. For example, this building, now a hotel, is known as the Old Pilchard Works, 
a Victorian-era venue for the pressing and salting of pilchards caught in the waters off Mausel. For centuries, pilchards were some of the most traded fish here. In fact, in the early days of the port in the 14th century, records show that pilchards caught by local fishermen were regularly being exported across the Channel to people in Brittany and the rest of northern France. Meanwhile, a few doors along from the old pilchard works, the road joins with Mill Lane here, home to the Mill Pool, a rather large 18th century cottage which now plays home to a small group of village shops and a cafe, as well as a couple more residences further inside. As the name suggests, it's around here that a village mill was once located. Because of course, during Mausel's commercial heyday before the Spanish attack, there was much more going on than just people buying and selling fish. With so much activity occurring around the main trade on the harbour, more and more people moved to this village over the centuries, working in a variety of industries that tacked onto the side of the main fishing industry. As we mentioned by the Ship Inn earlier on, the existence of five separate inns in this one small village is an example of this. People who'd sailed a long distance from elsewhere in Cornwall, or even from across the Channel in France, would often need a place to rest before returning home. There were also mills and workshops selling textiles, metal goods and more to the large number of people in this village, which during its peak certainly surpassed the likes of Newlyn and Penzance nearby in terms of economic importance. But as we know, decline eventually came about after the attack of 1595. And while local trade remained in operation, Mausel never really managed to recapture its medieval golden age in the following centuries. Now, as we just saw, where mills and workshops once stood, you'll now find a collection of galleries and small shops, which occupy a few of the buildings in the heart of the village. But in the modern day, tourism often leads the way in Mausel and so many of the historic houses surrounding us now have been converted for use as holiday homes. It's no wonder why so many people from outside the area are drawn to Mausel. As we know, it's one of the loveliest villages in Cornwall. But as is the case in many other picturesque fishing villages around Cornwall, tourism, and particularly holiday homes, are a double-edged sword for the local community. In the modern day, tourism is without doubt the main driver of income in Mausel, but this small village is visited by tens of thousands of people every year, a number of whom understandably would like to stay for more than just a day trip. The topic of over-tourism then is a touchy one in Cornwall, because while the region remains heavily reliant on income brought by visitors, local communities, such as the one in Mausel, often find themselves second in line to the needs of tourists, with local house prices, for example, driven up beyond levels that locals can afford by those looking for second homes by the sea. Now, we're walking around Mausel in the summer, when the streets are busier, business is booming and most of the houses are occupied. But of course Mausel is here all year round, and in the winter, when harsher weather conditions prompt many holiday homeowners to move away, the village is unfortunately left as what some call a bit of a ghost town, with just the few hundred permanent local residents remaining throughout the colder months. As we said, it's a touchy topic with no easy answer. But while Mausel is undoubtedly gorgeous in the summer, as we can see, the village is also an attraction in the winter too, as it's well known for its gorgeous Christmas lights that illuminate the harbour and draw in many people from all over. If you find yourself in Penwith during the winter, don't miss the chance to see Mausel's spectacular Christmas lights. But turning our attention back to the summertime now, here we find ourselves on the interestingly named Duck Street, where there stands a rather grand building just beside us. Built back in 1844, this large stone building was once the village's Mount Zion Methodist Church, a major place of worship for the local Methodist community during a period when the religious denomination was growing rapidly across Britain. The church remained in operation for more than a hundred years, eventually closing in 1987 and being converted into a home, which stands rather imposingly at the top of Duck Street here, or as it's known in Cornish, Strett Heiji. Now, as far as I can tell, there's no consensus on where the name Duck Street came from, 
and whether it was first named in Cornish or English. But while there is mystery behind the street's name, it's home to a number of buildings with a clear history. Just here, for example, we're passing by the Solomon Brown Memorial Hall, now Mausel's main community centre, but which actually started out life back in the 1890s, when it was built as a large storehouse for the pilchards caught by the village's fleet of fishing boats. After the community hall, Duck Street begins to narrow considerably, as it drops down the slope back towards Northcliffe and the harbour, with a number of colourful cottages and holiday homes lining the street. Like so much of the modern village, most of the houses that line this street date back to the 18th century, and as Duck Street continues to narrow further, as we near the harbour once again, just here we find some of its most fetching 18th century buildings, which rather fittingly bear a nice duck-themed decoration outside. These white stone buildings are a group of four old stores, which rather unusually feature no windows on the ground floor and only a few openings on the first floor up above. Today they've been put together to form the rather large and aptly named Duck Cottage, which is probably one of the prettiest holiday homes in the whole village today. But having made our way down Duck Street, possibly the narrowest of Mausel's many small streets and lanes, here we return to the North Cliff the harbourside street which offers yet more beautiful views over the village's delightful waterfront. From the Kegwin Arms to Dolly Pentreath's house, the old pilchard works and much more, we now know some of the famous buildings and captivating stories to be discovered on the streets hidden behind this stunning coastal vista. But while there is indeed plenty to be found looking inland, there's also an interesting landmark worth mentioning when we look back out to sea once again. About 400 yards off the coast of Mausel, on the other side of the harbour wall, you'll notice St Clement's Isle, the small islet which gave rise to Mausel's Cornish language name of Porthenis, or the port of the island. Now, while St Clement's Isle may seem far too small, rocky, and exposed to the waves of Mounts Bay to support any buildings or a permanent population, the story goes that it once did just that. According to local legend, St Clement himself was a hermit who lived on the islet, and we know for a fact that there was a chapel built on the island too, possibly sometime around the year 600 AD and it remained standing for nearly a thousand years, until at least the mid-16th century. The historic chapel may now be long since gone, but St Clement's Isle is one of a number of interesting spots that are worth taking a look at along Mausel's coastline. Here we've made our way just out of the heart of the village, where a visitor car park gives way to a part of the coastal path, which winds its way between the cliffs just to our left and the sea on our right. Now, if the weather's good and you're feeling up to it, if you follow this path for about three miles along the coast, then you'll reach the town of Penzance. Although for the especially daring, you can go even further. This path is part of the Southwest Coast Path, which is the longest waymarked walking route in all of England running for a mammoth 360 miles all the way around the southwest of the country. It runs from the town of Minehead, two counties over in Somerset, then goes all the way around Devon and Cornwall here, before following the coast of the English Channel back towards Poole Harbour in Dorset. On the route you'll find plenty of intriguing islands like St Clement's Isle and Mount St Michael, as well as a wealth of gorgeous seaside towns and villages, and of course an unlimited array of stunning windswept coastal vistas, with plenty of places to stop and relax on a lengthy stroll. For instance, just a few steps away from Mausel Harbour here, we find the village's beloved rock pool, a shallow swimming pool built into the rocks. During high tide the pool is often submerged beneath the water, but that fills it up enough to expose what we see at low tide now, a pleasant swimming area with yet more lovely coastal views. The rock pool was built in the 20th century, as sea bathing became ever more popular across England, and it's still visited by many today, 
a delightful hidden gem just a stone's throw from the busy heart of this beautiful Cornish village. But sadly, having made our way up and down the streets and along the coast, it's here that we've reached the end of our walk around Mausel. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you're now looking forward to making your own trip to Mausel sometime soon.